If it's Wednesday, contrast of character. Former Vice President Mike Pence, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, and current North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum all launched their presidential campaigns and all pitched primary voters to back them over Trump. Plus, the latest twists and turns in the special counsel's criminal probe into the former president, including new grand jury testimony and signs that charging decisions could be potentially coming any day now. And smoke from the Canadian wildfires blanket the Northeast in a toxic haze, triggering air quality alerts for millions, ground stops at some of the busiest airports in the country as forecasters try to figure out how long the smoke will stick around. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Chuck Todd reporting from a, yes, hazy Washington, D.C. As the Republican presidential primary is getting hot and, yeah, a little smoky. Over the last 24 hours, three new candidates have officially thrown their hats into the ring, all making overt or covert contrasts of character with the current field's frontrunner former President Donald Trump, including two of them who were some of the chief enablers of some of Donald Trump's worst behaviors. Last night, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie took square aim at Mr. Trump when he announced his candidacy at a town hall in New Hampshire, calling Trump selfish and his presidency a failure. Take a listen. A lonely, self-consumed, self-serving mirror hog <laughs> is not... A leader. It's not amusing anymore. It's not entertaining anymore. It is the last throes of a bitter, angry man who wants power back for himself, not for you. Interesting use of the word mirror there with those remarks. Christie appears to be relishing his role as the Trump attack dog in this primary field. But Christie comes with a heavy amount of baggage on his own, his gushing endorsement of Donald Trump after the New Hampshire primary in 2016 was one of the first instances where the Republican establishment gave Trump mainstream credibility. Chris Christie himself was the almost lone member of the supposed establishment to go ahead and coronate Trump. And it was a key boost for Trump's candidacy. Another major boost back then for Trump's credibility within the GOP came from Mike Pence as he was on his way to becoming Trump's vice president. This afternoon, Pence officially announced he's running against his old boss praising the work they did in the White House, but attacking Trump for his actions on January 6 and his push for Pence to overturn the election illegally. The American people deserve to know that on that day, President Trump also demanded that I choose between him and the Constitution. Now voters will be faced with the same choice. I chose the Constitution. And I always will. But I had no right to overturn the election. And Kamala Harris will have no right to overturn the election when we beat them in 2024. Both Pence and Christie enter the field against Trump after, in some ways, enabling Trump. And then essentially standing by him all the way up until that day on January 6th. In addition to Christie and Pence, North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum also announced his candidacy today from Fargo with a kickoff speech that didn't include any Trump-style attacks or negativity. Instead, he focused on his own background and this crazy idea that you don't hear a lot from on the right these days of unity. Growing up in a small town, you learn quickly the enemy isn't each other. Our enemies aren't our neighbors down the street. Our enemies are countries that want to see our way of life destroyed. In a country built on neighbors helping neighbors, we become a country of neighbors fighting neighbors. We should all be fighting to unite the country against our con common enemies like China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and the drug cartels. Folks, all three of these newly minted candidates have hinged their campaigns on a contrast of character with Trump. But the question remains if there's any desire for an alternative to the man many Republican voters still are enamored with. Dasha Burns is following the newly launched Pence campaign in Iowa. Steve Patterson is on the ground in Fargo for us. Uh, he was at the Burgum kickoff. And Vaughn Hilliard, who's been on the road recently with the Trump campaign, will be here for some perspective. But Dasha, let me start with you, with Vice President Pence. Uh, he, is, he is taking what might be 
the biggest problem he'll have to win over a Trump supporter and trying to turn it into his biggest asset as a candidate, you, you, you've been around here, is, is picking the Constitution over Trump something Republicans want to agree with him about? Well, look, Chuck, I think there's been a calculation made here that when it comes to January 6th, the only way out is through. Look, this is something that has hung over his vice presidency, now hangs over his candidacy, potentially over his legacy in the Republican Party. So uh, the former vice president has to address it. He has to make clear where he stands. And, and today he was as clear, as direct and as sharp in terms of his criticism of the former president as he could be. And when I talk to voters here, and mind you, these are folks who came out to uh, the announcement, the mm -hmm. event of, of the former president, they did find it interesting the way that he explained and walked people through what he believes the Constitution, what, what he believes he, he should have done that day based on what is in the Constitution. And I had one gentleman tell me, listen, I wore a Trump hat for seven years, but today I took it off and I'm open. And he really liked the constitutional argument. I mean, this is something that has been a foundation for the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. So there, there is openness to that line of thinking. Right. I think the challenge is we have 10 candidates now, and there is a, a tough path for uh, the former vice president where he has to walk that line of, look, here's what we did well right. in the administration. At the same time, he has to take on his former boss. Tough needle to thread, but there was a good response to what he what he did and said here today, Joe. Look, they were on message with their Wi-Fi password, right? Kept his oath uh, is the password mm -hmm. for you guys to have Wi-Fi at the announcement. I'm curious, is this a one-state campaign for now? That this is, he knows it's, uh, you know, he's got to, if he's going to make it anywhere else, Iowa's got to be the first place he makes it. It's Iowa or it's nowhere. Yeah. This is a huge focus for this campaign. This is where the, the evangelical base is, where they think he will have the, the, the best sort of connection with those voters. They plan to go to all 99 counties, all 71 pizza ranches, a big yeah. mainstay here in Iowa, and really work those retail politics. This is the best shot that he has if he comes in first, huge, second, okay, third, fourth, yeah. fifth, then that, that campaign loses all its momentum. Yeah, it's the old Glenn, Gary, Glenn Ross. First and second place are real prizes. Third place, you're fired. Uh, and, and that's probably the problem he's got there in Iowa. Dasha Burns uh, with the Pence campaign. Dasha, thanks. Let me go over to Steve Patterson. And Steve, you may not realize this today, but you were in a time machine because what you saw today is the way <laughs> candidates used to announce for the presidency in their yep. hometowns, with their supporters, in their home states, uh, talking about what they, who they are, uh, and what they may be for, yep. rather than talking about what they think everybody on cable television was about. Tell me about it, because it was a throwback for me. Yeah, it, it certainly was a throwback. Look, I, I'm from uh, suburban Detroit, Automation Alley, Michigan. Our fathers were engineers for Ford and GM and mm -hmm. Chrysler. And, and so if I was talking to one of my friends, I would say that this is the conservative that our fathers knew, somebody that mm -hmm. is, you know, focused on big business and low government and low taxes and policy minded focus solely on the issues. And that is certainly what Bergham pertains to be. There was, sure, there was mention of, uh, of the president, but not in any sort of social way, focused solely attacking his policies. Uh, no mention of social issues. You, you didn't hear anything about woke or books. You didn't hear anything about DeSantis or Trump. Almost no mention of opponents uh, because he wants to stick to those policy issues. Now, that's not to say that he hasn't signed off on certain social issues. Of course, recently signing legis legislation that makes it one of the hardest states in the country to get an abortion, to be transgender, certainly banning some of the rights right. that transgender folks have in, in the state. But as far as mentioning any of that in his campaign speech or throughout the campaign, as expected, he's not going to do that. And he's not going to attack his opponents. So it's suffice to say, it would be interesting to see it whether or not this strategy uh, works. Right, Chuck? Well, I have to ask you this, Steve. You know, if he hadn't held office right now, yep. uh, I, I, I might want to dismiss this as a vanity project, a la Vivek Ramaswamy, yep. who has his own money and it's decided, hey, why not? I'm going to buy my way on the stage here. Now, he's a multimillionaire, uh, Doug Burgum is. He had some success in the tech community here. Um, is this a vanity project or does he have a theory of the case here? 
He truly believes that in being an alternative to the rhetoric that we hear from the Republican Party in modern times, that there is this silent majority of Republicans that is out there, that is waiting for a champion to believe in and to vote for, and that he can stoke that, mm -hmm. even as a relative unknown, polling it up something about 1% or so, mm -hmm. that just by putting this message out here and saying, you have an alternative at home, uh, that he can make some headway, Chuck. All right, Steve Patterson in Fargo. Steve, thank you. So let's go over to Vaughn Hilliard, who has been in touch with Team Trump all day today. And uh, they've been very aggressive at responding to every candidacy, so I know you've been hearing a lot from them. Let's start with their reaction to Christie before I get to Pence. <laughs> because uh, one line in particular, Chris Christie describing Donald Trump this way, a lonely, self-consumed, self-serving mirror hog is not a leader. Um, the Donald Trump I know would sort of try to throw that back right back at Chris Christie, who himself is clearly looking for his own version of redemption here. Right. He, Donald Trump, in a video that he posted last night, you know, just to completely minimize Chris Christie and to diminish him as any credible figure, posted a video in which there's a graphic of Chris Christie holding a plate of food. I mean, this is the type of Oof. politics that it's not even, it's, it's diminished. I mean, Doug Burgum, God bless the man, wanting to talk about policy, but that is not what Donald Trump is here to talk about. And it's not even on the credentials. It's on it, it, purely hitting back on the criticisms and Donald Trump's own recognition that Chris Christie, who helped him on debate prep in the 2020 debate against Joe Biden, right. uh, just a couple of years later here, is looking to take him on directly. And Donald Trump is looking Looking to, I guess, play, you can call it mean, I guess, in juvenile terms, but that's right. kind of what it is. Do they, do you think they are going to show up to these early debates? I mean, you know, I, I, I've heard different theories of the case. I talked with uh, former Governor Scott Walker. He's pretty convinced Trump is a prize fighter and he wants to show up. And I said, yeah, but prize fighters don't fight undercards. Right. I think the big interesting point of that is just how many people are going to be on the debate stage. If with that 45,000 uh, 45, donor threshold mm -hmm. requirement, I mean, if there's a chance that Chris Christie doesn't even make the debate stage or Asa Hutchinson doesn't make the debate stage and it comes down to just Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy and Ron DeSantis, at that point, does it kind of force his hand to get on the debate stage there? I think that is kind of an outstanding question. You know, for Donald Trump, the other part of this weird reality is I'm watching Steve yeah. talk about being in North Dakota and Dasha talk Talking about Iowa today, the head focus for me covering Donald Trump has very much been the legal end of this. Well, I'm about to and get so to that before we <laughs> fit it right after we wrap up with you. No, right, right, and that's the part. It's, it's yeah. more of a campaign for Donald Trump against him against everybody else, and that yeah. includes the justice system. It includes these Republicans who he feels like are taking the side of the deep state by yeah. undermining the MAGA movement. I mean, it's just as much political it is, as it is just Donald Trump against the world. And it is fascinating. Every one of their releases about these candidates, they want to make say up. Oh, this is bad for Ron DeSantis. Uh, and that's how they view this, right? Very quick, Vaughn. Right. And this is essentially, it's, are you coming in defense of Donald Trump here at this point? Right. Uh, that is kind of the issue here is that they're putting the onus on him. And Mike Pence, uh, you know, look at the guy ignored the f last four years of serving with Donald Trump largely and is looking to make this something beyond. We shall see how that works. Vaughn Billiard, again, on the Trump beat. And as he said, we're on the legal beat today, which I'm about to get to. Vaughn, thank you. So... Yes, Looming over this entire primary is the potential for more criminal charges against the field's frontrunner. Does it help him? Does it hurt him? Today, former Trump spokesperson Taylor Budovich testified before a grand jury in Florida that was tied to the special counsel Jack Smith's criminal investigation into Trump's handling, mishandling of classified documents. There's a separate grand jury that has been meeting here in Washington that also is a part of the special counsel's investigations. Possibly that's more January 6th related, because remember, Smith has two investigations that are related to Trump. Trump's actions that are tied to January 6th and the classified documents. So while they're the same investigator, they are two different uh, investigations. Now, Budowich confirmed his testimony today via Twitter, slamming the probe as a, quote, bogus and deeply troubling effort to use the power of government to, quote, get Trump. Meanwhile, the New York Times is reporting that former Trump chief of staff Mark Meadows has already testified before Smith's grand jury. Although it's unclear if he testified about the classified documents case, January 6th or both, clearly January 6th would be the most likely Meadows situation. Today, Trump lashed out at all the investigations facing him via his social media platform, calling prosecutors, quote, fascists. So joining me now is Mark Zaid. He's an attorney who focuses on national security and government investigations. So, Mark, uh, let's talk about two grand juries. 
one in Miami, one in D.C. Uh, why does Jack Smith have multiple grand juries? Well, most of these Espionage Act cases that deal with mishandling of classified information or leak cases to the media, the government always tries to bring them either in the Eastern District of Virginia, the mm -hmm. CIA's backyard, or Washington, D.C., because of the expertise and experience that both the prosecutors and, of course, the judges have. There are some concerns from a legal perspective if some of the acts, such as obstruction or mishandling down in Florida, could impact the venue, meaning if they brought charges in D.C., Trump could file motions to transfer the case down or parts of it down to Florida. So the running theory right now is, and there could be many things, is that this is an effort to possibly bifurcate, split the cases to have some claims down in Florida or some in D.C., or perhaps to move everything to one jurisdiction. Um, Buterich was pretty, uh, pretty pro-Trump in his reaction to how he testified. You would assume prosecutors knew that going in. Why do you put on a uh, potentially antagonistic witness in front of a grand jury? Well, they still have to tell the truth, of course, or they're liable for their own incriminating behavior. What I didn't see in his tweet was anything substantive about what transpired in the grand jury, which a witness is perfectly free to do. Uh, I think that is particularly telling. Now, I imagine he's more of a fact witness. You know, did he see documents down at Mar-a-Lago? Or more precisely, perhaps, did he ever hear the president of the United mm -hmm. States declassify these magic documents or magically declassify them by his verbiage, which we've heard that Cash Patel, former Defense Department chief of staff, uh, has made some claims and has been brought before the grand jury as well. You're aware of all the speculation that something is close, something is imminent. Why, what has happened that gives credence to that speculation? What is actually taking place that's a, that tells you, well, I understand why people think it could be at now because of X. What are the X's? Hey, that's a great question. I mean, I, for one, am somewhat surprised it has taken this long uh, for all the facts to be gathered by the grand juries and a decision to be made. I'm getting a lot of media uh, contact and, and requests to prepare me for sure. today, tonight, yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> and, and I have no idea where this is all coming from other than uh, people assume, I think at this point, that we're clearly close to the end. And, and I think that's a fair assumption that we are. But whether or not it is next week versus the end of July, I'm not sure, unless someone has an incredibly close yeah. inside source to the Attorney General or Smith, that anyone can really do anything but just predict. Uh, right. Uh, do, you, do you have any reason to believe that these would, the charges, the charging decisions for January 6th on the classified documents would be done in the same week, or that this could be spaced out a bit? No, I think they could absolutely be spaced out. And, and you could clearly, January 6th case would be in D.C., and the classified documents, the national defense information, as the statute actually calls it, could be in either jurisdiction or both. Are they better off? It sounds like you think it's almost it's it sort of short circuits one of the delays that could happen with this case if they just go ahead and make South Florida the location for the Mar-a-Lago indictment. Well, certainly for claims of obstruction particularly where we know, at least from media reports, that there were boxes moved, that there were plans uh, ahead of the FBI searching as to what to do with documents, that we have uh, Evan Corcoran, uh, one of Trump's lawyers, expressing concerns that he might have been misled about whether or not documents actually classified records still existed at Mar-a-Lago. There's clearly a lot of facts that yeah. pertain specifically to the jurisdiction, which I guess would be the, the Miami District Court. Why would there. it be Miami and not the Palm, Palm Beach? I thought, isn't there, I don't think South Florida, there are all three counties. I think there might one. be a, a satellite yeah. branch. That, so, but it's part of the Miami District. It is. Um, let me, considering that the Trump folks complained about the politics of New York, New Yorkers in the E. Jean Carroll case, we've heard it about D.C., um, would this be smart by Garland and Smith? It's like, all right, we'll do your home county there, buddy. We'll go to Palm Beach County. That's where you're a resident now. Uh, and if you're convicted there, I don't think you can have a beef about the politics. 
No, and look, D.C. for sure is predominantly Democratic by by way of politics, and it would be a better jurisdiction from a jury standpoint uh, to bring the case in D.C. Uh, there would be a ton of what we call voir dire questioning of the jury to determine whether or not there is some sort of bias, and the Trump uh, legal team would be able to remove jurors right. if that is the case. Uh, without a doubt, uh, it would be uh, there is an optic to have it down in Florida. Uh, I'm I'm from New York, Long Island, uh, New yeah. York City area. There's a lot of my folks down there, yes, there is. in his jurisdiction. So it's not necessarily a Republican venue either I, in, in that, although it's probably more uh, likely to be. Of no, course. I, look, it's actually a pretty Democratic county. So that's the irony there. It's like, all right, are you going to complain about here, too? It's like, you, you, you know, it, it, it's this is the best location he's going to get. And it's still probably not a great one if he really thinks politics impacts it. No, facts are facts. These are the jurisdictions right. that the facts are in play. Mark Zaid, uh, very helpful for you to uh, give us your expertise with this. And hey, Anytime. you're being prepped for any day now, just like we any are. Any day, any, any day, day now. All right, thank you, sir. You are thank looking you. live right now at pictures of New York. Yes, if you can see it, nothing wrong with your TV. Uh, that's via EarthCam, and folks, that's not that a filter. That's just the air. After the break, we're going to have the latest as dense smog and smoke from the wildfires in Canada sweep across the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. It has created air traffic issues and a lot of health concerns. Maybe better go get the masks. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We turn now to the growing disruption and health warnings that are facing now millions of Americans as huge swaths of the country. From New England to South Carolina contend with a toxic blanket of smoke and haze from wildfires that are raging across Canada. Right now, New York City is the worst air quality among all major cities worldwide, according to Swiss air monitoring company IQ Air. Officials across 18 states have warned residents to avoid outdoor activity. Flights in and out of LaGuardia were grounded this afternoon due to low visibility. And New York City has canceled all after-school outdoor programming due to health concerns, as the National Weather Service warns of another large plume of smoke descending from Canada towards New York and Pennsylvania this afternoon. More than 400 wildfires burning across Canada and about 250 considered out of control. The country is facing one of its worst starts to wildfire season on record. Joined now by NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens. Also with me is NBC News correspondent Tom Costello, who's been covering the travel delay end of this. But, Bill, let me start with you. And um, when we're going to get some relief uh, through New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, D.C., these big four cities here, all feeling it, obviously New York the worst. It's not going to be until the wind direction changes. I mean, it's either the fires have to go out or we have to completely change the wind direction to blow all the smoke out. And for the last couple of days, the wind has been out of the north because of a big storm up here near the Canadian Maritimes. And that has just been driving all of the smoke southwards. We had the one plume yesterday and then this huge plume. You can see it right there. Mm -hmm. Just went through New York City about three hours ago. Now it just went through Philadelphia. You're going to start to see more stuff on social media about the Philadelphia area. Looks the like a hurricane quality. band, the way you're describing it. It's like a band. <laughs> Almost. Yeah, I mean, we can see it on satellite, almost like an outer band on a nor'easter or a, yeah. you know, a tropical storm or a hurricane. We can we can see it. I mean, we saw this morning, it's Syracuse's air quality this morning. You know, I, we keep throwing these numbers out. It was over 400. All you need to know is that they've never even had anything up to 200 previously. So this was like completely out of the ballpark. What is Nothing that, that measuring? By the way, when you say 200 and 400, on what scale is this? Just for my own edification. Okay, so anything over 500 is considered extremely hazardous. Anything over 400 is considered hazardous. And that's not for, like, Chuck, that's not for, like, elderly and children and respiratory. That's yeah. for you and me or anyone else outdoors. Wow. Once it's over 400, they tell you, go inside. And that's what's currently starting to happen in the New York City area. And they have to make a tough decision if they're going to cancel that Yankee game or not tonight. I know the New York City Health Department's already said, stay indoors. And if you're outside, wear a mask. It'll be interesting to see if they cancel that game. So this is that area where it's worth. I mean, we've got air pollution right now from the smoke from Charlotte all the way up to Maine, but this is the really dangerous stuff from central New York, northeast Pennsylvania, Allentown, Scranton. Yeah. The air is horrendous right now and into New York City, and we're showing you those numbers. So here's our little chart. New York City right now is at 392. That's in the hazardous category. New York City easily chalked by the end of today. This will be the worst pollution day we've had ever in the city's monitoring, which goes from, you know, about 1999 to now, about 24 years. 
And this will be worse than yesterday, which broke the old record, by the way, wow. which happened to be from wildfires in the early 2000s. And it's not just New York. You notice that Syracuse and Allentown, and it doesn't really improve. Tomorrow morning, it gets less. Notice D.C. tomorrow morning, Chuck, 9 a.m. It'll Oof. be the worst that you've seen it. Um, but it's only going to be a slow improvement. Saturday is when things should change dramatically. Wow, we've never wanted a storm from the west to blow in so fast in my life. Anyway, yes. Bill Karens uh, with the uh, meteorological side of the story. Bill, thank you. Let me go to the impact on travel. Uh, Tom Costello, what does this mean? I mean, the, the northeast corridor, it's already super busy. Yep. This ends up, I assume, having cascading effects all over the country. No, that's absolutely right. And you mentioned it off the top. For a time there, they, the FAA uh, put a pause on all departures and arrivals into LaGuardia Airport. That has since been lifted, but it is a very slow trickle uh, right now. In fact, we've got two-hour delays on arrival into LaGuardia. Look at that. Mm. Two-hour delays into arrival at LaGuardia, 30 minutes on departure. Newark right now, 82 minutes on the delay situation. Philly is about 30 minutes or so. I just checked on the, on the total nationwide picture. We've got 2,400 delays nationwide. Amazingly, only 127 cancellations, mm. but 2,400 delays. And here are the most affected airports. Really, no surprise. LaGuardia, uh, Newark, Charlotte. You're thinking Charlotte? Yeah, well, the ripple effect, right? you got an mm -hmm. American Airlines hub there. Uh, Toronto, no surprise there. And also DCA Reagan. And the talk is that tomorrow it's going to be even worse, as you heard from Bill, here in the D.C. area. So that will, of, of course, affect Philly as well as Baltimore and Reagan and uh, Dulles. And then it will continue. The ripple effect is what we talk about, right? It's the same thing yep. with the severe rain, severe snow. You start getting behind the eight ball and the airlines struggle to catch up. And then that goes all the way into the evening and then potentially the next day as well. So this is a really bad situation. And let's just keep in mind, when you get upset about these delays, yeah. it's not the airlines doing it, nope. it's the FAA because of low visibility and they just want to keep things safe. Yeah, the airlines are not in charge of these decisions. It is all right. FAA. Yep. All right. Tom Costello with a, a good warning for anybody who is traveling in the Northeast tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Up next, the latest fallout from the front lines as Ukraine faces a new humanitarian emergency amid the launch of its spring counteroffensive. How bad is the damage from the broken dam? You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. We may be inching closer to another showdown over the war in Ukraine, this time inside the Republican Party, amid signs of a growing divide between House Republicans and Senate Republicans over the future of what U.S. aid to Ukraine will look like. Republicans in the Senate are already raising the idea of a supplemental spending bill for the Defense Department. It's a way to get around some of the spending caps that were negotiated between Speaker McCarthy and President Biden to raise the debt limit. And there's some Republican leaders saying this deal fully funds defense. I'll be trying to get the money into the system that we need to maintain readiness and going below inflation in this environment is insane. There's no money in the bill at all for Ukraine. If your first process is I need a supplemental, you're not paying attention to, not you, but the senators are not paying attention to how the system works. We will go through the appropriation process and we will do the numbers that we just agreed to. And the idea that they think they're going to go around it is not going to work. Well, it all comes at a critical moment in this war after a major attack on a Ukrainian dam and as Kiev readies its long-anticipated counteroffensive. Joining me now is our uh, Kremlinologist, Michael McFall, the former U.S. ambassador to Russia and NBC News international affairs analyst. Um, Mike, about two months ago, the Pentagon magically found an accounting error that allowed it to find $3 billion more of aid to Ukraine. I don't know if there's more accounting errors that can be found between now and then, um, but what should Ukraine's level of concern be about this debate between essentially Lindsey Graham and Kevin McCarthy? Uh, they should be concerned uh, because we're all talking about the counteroffensive, right? Chuck, we're waiting for it. Maybe it's happened. Uh, but my prediction is there are going to have to be multiple counteroffensives. Mm -hmm. The idea that this war is just going to end after a few months of fighting, I do not think will be true. I hope it's true. I hope the Ukrainians can push the Russian occupiers out in the next several months. But if they can't, they have to plan for new counteroffensives in the fall, in 2024, in 2025. And so, therefore, they're going to need support from us, I fear, for a lot more time yeah. than most Republicans now are talking about. 
I'm, I'm not as worried about it happening because there's a majority in the House for this. Now, it's not, right. a, it's not a majority of the Republican conference, but one could see the outlines of how this works. And you and I both know we had a Democratic Party that was not, a, not in favor of the Iraq war in 06, 07, but Nancy Pelosi always made supplementals go through. That's a great point. Uh, you know that history better than I do, even, yeah. Chuck. Thanks for reminding me. That is a great point. Um, and secondly, I would say a lot will also depend on the success of the counteroffensive. Right. Let's remember that. If it's successful, we like winners yes, here in the do. United States. Yeah. There will be more support. And my sense in talking to officials in Kiev is they fully understand that. Uh, I want to ask you about a couple other developments. Were you surprised to learn that we knew in advance that Ukrainian special forces were thinking about sabotaging Nord Stream and that if that's the case, we did nothing about it? No, honestly, I wasn't surprised. Uh, we have a great intelligence community. We have great resources that allow us to know these things. Uh, just because you and I don't get to hear about them doesn't mm -hmm. mean that the U.S. government doesn't. And the fact that they didn't react, I think, was the proper response. Uh, somehow there's this weird notion sometimes in the debate about this war is that Ukraine's just supposed to defend its territory. <laughs> with you, yes. They're not, they're not allowed to do what every other country has done in the course of human history when right. fighting wars. And I just think we got to get used to that fact. They're fighting a war. Uh, they're allowed to take on targets that they think are military targets. And unlike Mr. Putin, they tend to focus just on military targets, not civilian targets. Well, do you think that there's some strategy here that might be smart, that the more attacks in Moscow, uh, the more where, where there's clearly a debate inside, the, at least the defense side of thing, between uh, Pergozin and, and, and Putin's uh, defense minister there, uh, do you think these attacks only help create, you know, stoke that divide even more? I think it's creating a lot of anxiety inside Russia, for sure. Mm -hmm. Even some of the Putin propagandists now are talking about a ceasefire. They never expected the war to come to their borders. And in Belgorod, too, remember uh, that operation mm -hmm. there? That was shocking to people in Russia. Um, and the next thing I think we should watch for is will the Ukrainian armed forces take the battle to Crimea? Uh, I suspect they will if they have the opportunity to do so, and that will be symbolically very serious uh, in, in Moscow among the elite. They never expected they might lose some of the, the territory that they had gained in 2014, right. and now it might be put into play. Hey, I want to get your reaction to this uh, PGA Tour live Saudi, basically the Saudi government's purchase of professional golf globally. And I say this because... Joe Biden campaigned on making Saudi a pariah state. If he's made it a pariah state, this is uh, quite a successful pushback by the Saudi government. It doesn't look like a pariah state to me. I agree. I was disappointed. Um, I'm kind of shocked that it happened so fast that there wasn't debate. I mean, there are no congressional hearings about this. Think about it, Chuck. Like, if this were the Chinese, uh, we'd be having a huge debate about it. Uh, we'd want to look By the into way, it. isn't that how the Saudis get away with this? Do you want us to go work with the Chinese? And so we just capitulate as a government. We capitulate as a set of private business leaders. I mean, I, look, as much as the PGA looks really shameless here, it's the American government that said it's OK to do business with MBS when, when the president fist bumped them. I agree. And I don't think it's smart. Uh, I knew Jamal Khashoggi, uh, who was assassinated, murdered, killed uh, by this regime. Let's not forget that. Mm -hmm. um, I hope the PGA doesn't forget that, by the way. Maybe they could honor him in some way at one of their tournaments. Oh, God. But in the long term, I think we've just got to have a readjustment about what is in America's national interests. And, and selling out for short-term things, thinking that we're losing influence, just like you said, to the Chinese, or in this case, also the Russians. Don't right. forget Vladimir Putin has yeah. a relationship with MBS. I think we got to think longer term uh, and think about energy in a different way and think about our morality in a different way. If we are in a long-term struggle with the Chinese, which I think we are for the 21st century, one of our greatest assets in that 
is democracy and human rights. Yeah. When we compromise that, we lose one of our greatest advantages vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese Communist Party. And then everything becomes a zero-sum game. Uh, yep. Ambassador McFaul, uh, always good to get your perspective on these things. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Coming sure. up, I'm going to dive deeper, by the way, into the uh, Saudi PGA Tour situation. But first, we're going to dive deeper into the clash of the campaigns as the former president faces a growing field of foes for the Republican nomination. Is it just what he wants? Panel's next. I am proud to be here to endorse Donald Trump for president of the United States. I've been on that stage. I've gotten to know all the people on that stage. Um, and there is no one who is better prepared to provide America with the strong leadership uh, that it needs, both at home and around the world, um, than Donald Trump. Welcome back. That was Chris Christie seven years ago, throwing his support behind Trump after his own presidential bid failed spectacularly. And here's Christie last night speaking to his supporters about his 2016 strategy as he enters the 2024 field. It was a mistake in 2016 not to confront Donald Trump early. Because I knew that so much of what he said was complete baloney. Okay, you heard what he said about Donald Trump at the beginning there and what he said last night. Christie's past may make him uh, an imperfect messenger of Trump criticism, but his candidacy raises a bigger question. Is an anti-Trump candidate what the party actually wants? Joining me now for our panel today, Tia Mitchell, Washington correspondent for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, former Democratic congressman from New York, Joe Crowley, and former Republican congressman from Illinois, Rodney Davis. Tia, I'll, I'll start with you. I... Is Chris Christie too flawed of a messenger to make this case? I think he's pretty flawed, and I think that Trump and a lot of Republicans are going to be troubled by the flip-flopping that has occurred over the years. Um, but you raise the bigger point, which is what does the Republican electorate want out of a candidate? And it doesn't seem like they want a, a, a Trump detractor. They possibly mm -hmm. want someone who can take them beyond Trump, but there's no evidence that they want someone who will go up against Trump. And that's, I think, where there might be a difficulty for Chris Christie to make a lane for himself. Look, in some ways, Mike Pence tried to go up against him, too. Ronnie Davis, you, I, I would argue you tried the Mike Pence approach a bit, <laughs> right? No, you've been out there. You know what this electorate wants. Are they buying? It feels like Chris Christie's selling cat food to dogs. Like, are they buying this? Look, I consider Vice President Pence and Governor Christie friends. Mm -hmm. um, but in this race, it is much different than 2016. Donald Trump is a known quantity to the American people. And right now, polling shows most Republicans favor him as their nominee. I, I saw Governor Christie a few months ago here in D.C. And I believe that, you know, I didn't sit and have a long conversation with him. But Chris Christie knows that he's a very good debater. And in 2016, he eviscerated my candidate, Marco Rubio, on the debate stage. Chris Christie can do that again, mm -hmm. in his mind, to Donald Trump. In his mind. You mm -hmm. just said it. In his mind. Because, Joe, I go back. If he was such a good debater, why was it only that moment? Where was he? He was in all the other debates, too. And yeah. he couldn't take down Trump. And he couldn't take down Kasich. And he couldn't. So he took down a guy who wasn't a threat to win a primary anywhere. I, I, do I don't think, know how impressed we all should be. I, I think what Chris lacks in terms of authenticity... Uh, within the party structure itself, and certainly this field, he does make up in terms of his veracity, his, his, you know, his... He, he, he he's fearless. He's fearless, yeah. and he, he, can drop him, he can drop him as well as Trump can. Um, I think he also has the experience as a government prosecutor, as a former governor. He's been around a lot of this as well. And I also think, you know, with all due respect to everything, January 6th changed everything for many people. He, I think he has that as an excuse, as a reason, as like... Is it, it Mike Pence a should better be. position for should that be. excuse? Should yeah. be, but right? didn't cooperate. Yeah, he didn't should cooperate. be. I mean, and he has done it to an extent. Um, he, not uh, he made it more part of his announcement than I expected, to yeah. be frank. I was surprised at how front and center, and now I understand why he did it. He's like, in order to support him, you got to get over that fact. Right, you got to address right. it, because that is such a part of... His identity. His, his identity and yeah. his story as it relates to Donald Trump. Um, but Mike Pence has pulled punches at times. Mike Pence has gone after Trump, and then the next statement hasn't been as strong. And, and, and I think that's why Chris Christie thinks he can be that person, yeah. you know, almost like the sacrificial lamb. I wonder if he kind of envisions himself in that way. Um, 
But again, I don't know if you're talking about just Republicans, just in the primary, I don't know if January 6th is mm. as much of a deciding factor right. as it might be in a general election. Mm. Um, Roddy, Doug Burgum, he, he just reminded me of a throwback candidacy, and I say that as a compliment. Like he was, he even did an announcement the way it used to be done, not in the way we do it today. Um, it seems like a long shot that anybody will consider him, but he does have his own money, and that, that obviously early can, can, can at least help get you in the conversation. We'll see if that translates to him getting on the debate stage. I sat with Governor Burgum in his office in North Dakota about two years ago for an hour. Great guy, great oh, history. Oh, I find him fascinating. He's I, fascinating, I but he's not going to be fascinating enough right now to the Republican primary electorate. Right now it's a two-person race between Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis. Yeah. And Trump is going to try to destroy DeSantis because he sees him as his top competition. But the candidate, the candidate that scares Democrats the most yeah. is Senator Tim Scott. Do you agree with that? I think it's, there's some truth to that. I yeah. think he, he, he really works into what, what is really a, a large portion of the base, of the Democratic base, uh, in, in particular African-American men mm -hmm. uh, who haven't been as loyal as I've some African-American women. I've talked to some White House women. political advisors. Yeah. Who are petrified yeah. of 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 how much they lost African American men the last mm -hmm. time, right? And and Kamala Harris didn't help with that, so they right. thought she would. And I, and I think that's the that's the issue there. That it, mm -hmm. you know, it, unlike other African American candidates who have run as Republicans before, this is different. Tia, I will say this about Tim Scott. He has been squishy on abortion, which I never would expect, but I think it's smart. He has not gotten stuck on six weeks. He's not getting stuck where Pence wants to go. He seems to almost say, look, I've got those credentials, but I realize the country's not where they are. And I think that what we're all saying is, is beneficial to Tim Scott in a general election. Yes. He's got to win primaries first. And how does he do that, being squishy on abortion, instead of being staunchly anti-abortion, staunchly But what if Trump's favor? squishy? Trump's squishy on this, too. Well, Trump has shown that he can play by different rules than everyone else. And that's just the truth. It is true. He's, He's squishy on everything. He's <laughs> squishy on a lot of things, and it hasn't damaged him the way that I think people might hold it against other candidates right. as they decide whether they're going to turn away from Donald Trump. Right. I, look, I, am, I think Tim Scott's the experiment I'm curious about, right? Because normally, candidate A and candidate B beat each other up, candidate C uh, benefits, and he's the best position candidate C right now financially. Um, do you think, though, his abortion position actually is too moderate for this electorate or not? I, with a Trump-DeSantis battle royale, um, I don't think abortion is going to be the number one issue that's going to be discussed in the Republican Amongst party. that fight. Amongst yeah. that fight. And, and frankly, I think Senator Scott has, has looked at his home state member of Congress, Nancy mm -hmm. Mace, to realize, you know, Nancy was able to she, kind of she thread the needle. This, yeah. And win by a very big margin in a very marginal district. And I think he saw some benefit of not engaging. He knows where his credentials are on this issue. But in the end, Tim Scott is the best position candidate to come in if Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump destroy each other like we've seen candidates. No, I, I, he does, and he financially has it. You know, I, I guess if you're the Democrats here, Joe, do you just sit back and watch or do you... Do you notice that Tim Scott's a problem and you try to help Republicans make sure they don't know? I think with such a large field, it goes back to, again, who's the large field benefit? I think it does benefit still Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. um, Trump really, thinks it benefits him. I, he talks sure about it all the time. Another bad day for Ron DeSantis. And I, I think it really depends on what damage can be done to Trump, what can actually stink, and what will matter in a Republican primary. Mm -hmm. And can anyone actually rise? Can any of this cream if it exists rise? And can... Uh, can uh, uh, any of them actually break through? I think that's the real question. There's a great op-ed today that I encourage everybody to read that Scott Walker wrote that for me felt like a Dear Ron letter, which was, uh, Tia, he, he talked about, he made a mistake in 2016. He tried to run on his record, and, and he's like, Trump ran on an idea, and these guys need to find an idea. And that's to say, he basically is was giving DeSantis advice. I don't know if DeSantis is going to listen. And that's, a, it's funny, I haven't seen the op-ed, but that's what I've been thinking is what lane are all of these candidates creating for themselves? And right. it doesn't seem to that's be a, a good clear way to put one. It. Yeah, there's one, you can fight in one lane, but you also got to make your own. You've got to make your own. And I think DeSantis lane is, I can be just as MAGA, mm -hmm. more MAGA, yeah. but not Trump. But there's, 
it's not clear if that's a winnable lane. What are the winnable lanes? Yeah, no, it's a good op-ed. I hope people take a look at it because it's uh, basically a candidate admitting I blew it and I shouldn't have listened to so many consultants. Uh, Tia, Joe, and Rodney, thank you guys. Uh, still to come, we're going to talk about the Saudi sellout, why the deal between the PGA and Liv is shaking up the world's, uh, worlds of golf and geopolitics. You're watching Meet the President. Welcome back. Yesterday, the PGA announced a stunning about face, a major merger with its biggest rival, Live Golf. The move has sent shockwaves through the sports world and beyond. Live Golf, of course, was backed by Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, which is controlled by the Crown Prince, has faced plenty of criticism since its inception with accusations of sports washing, using the sport to distract from the kingdom's history of gross human rights violations, including the murdering of journalists, including a Washington Post journalist. The PGA even barred its players from participating in any Live tournaments. And as we noted earlier, the Biden administration is a complicated relationship with Saudi Arabia. But here's what one of the Senate's top voices on foreign policy, Senator Chris Murphy, had to say earlier today. Let's be honest. The Saudis aren't buying the PGA because they love golf. They're buying the PGA because they want to erase their dizzying campaign of political repression. Joining me now is sports columnist at The Washington Post, Sally Jenkins. She is also author of the new book, The Right Call what sports teaches us about work and life. Well, Sally, I don't think you think this is the right call uh, mm. for the PGA Tour. What I want to get at is, what is Rory McIlroy and Tiger Woods thinking right now? Uh, well, to use Rory McIlroy's exact words, they're thinking they were sacrificial lambs for PGA Tour Commissioner Jay Monahan, who persuaded them to remain loyal to the PGA Tour, um, they're now discovering that Jay Monahan was loyal uh, primarily to himself. Um, and the same with a couple of PGA Tour policy board directors who have very interesting potential conflicts of interest here. Um, there's a member of the PGA Tour board named Edward Hurley, whose law firm is handling this merger. Um, they'll get all kinds of huge fees out of mm -hmm. it. And so the question is really, Who's this deal in the best interest of? I mean, that, that question really remains unanswered. And the PGA Tour has yet to explain right. why this is good for their players. So my, my only thesis I could come up with here is the PGA Tour was up against somebody that didn't care how much money they lost. And that is a scary opponent. And that Liv could have bankrupted. If Jay Monahan's excuse is either we bankrupt the PGA Tour or we merge, and that's why I did it, I... I I guess I could understand that line of thinking because I think that is true. I think Liv was willing to lose money for years. That, that may very well be true, uh, but the fact of the matter is that Liv was not really a threat to the PGA Tour zone business. Um, that's where the story sort of falls apart. Uh, Liv was not commanding a television deal. It wasn't commanding ratings. Uh, it wasn't really commanding any sponsorship. You know, it wasn't wounding the PGA Tour. Uh, the only thing that was conceivably wounding the tour was legal fees. Uh, it's hard to see. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really hard to see how any of the, these rationales are in the best interest of the PGA Tour players. Let me be more cynical. I'm well aware of the politics of golf fans. I've, I've studied the politics of all sports fan bases. I'm a sports junkie, so that's always been of interest to me, and I think it's always interesting. Golf's among the most conservative. Why do I think that the people most worked up about Saudi were the people least likely to watch a PGA tournament and that, unfortunately, the PGA Tour figured this out? Um, you know, I, I, look, I, I, I can't explain uh, the motives in this thing apart from money. That's it. That, yeah. uh, to me, it's like follow the money, go back to the money. That appears to be the only genuine, sincere motive in any of this, quite frankly. Well, then the scary thing is you got a Biden administration who, look, you know, four days before the infamous fist bump between President Biden and MBS, the Biden Justice Department announced an investigation about the golf tour, not live, but PGA. Like, well, and, the American my, government fell on itself to almost give the Saudis what they wanted here. You know, I, I, it, it's very, that's, a, that's a good point, and it's a curious point. Um, but I would actually say that the Justice Department may well take a look here at uh, the dealings of the PGA Tour Policy Board mm. um, with the Saudis, because it's hard. You can't exactly accuse the PGA Tour um, of forming, you know, of monopolistic behavior and then let them off the hook for forming a bigger monopoly. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes. 
Yes, I do. So do you have a concern now that, you know, I feel like our culture shifted a little bit here. There's a whole bunch of, well, you got yours. Go get yours. Uh, don't worry about it. You use your money anyway. And that all of a sudden this is going to open the door for more sports washing by the Saudis. Oh, I think it absolutely does. It also opens the door. Uh, look, they've seeded. They'll, if this deal goes through, and I'm not, I'm by no means yet convinced that it will go through. Um, if the deal goes through, uh, the, they have allowed uh, a single uh, Saudi financier and uh, arguably uh, a pre the predator behind him uh, to really control all of the commerce around golf worldwide. Mm. Uh, they, the Saudis are not going to spend two, three billion dollars buying golf. Um, and then sit around and not do harm to any conceivable competitors. They will, uh, they will, yep. they will use it to humiliate Western businesses. I'm convinced of that. Uh, and uh, it's I, not going to make the yep. world a better place or a more uh, fiscally fair place for golfers. Yep. It's going to really limit uh, things, no. not open. Them up. And they've put it all in the hands of one person. Why right. they would How do that? that yep. How does that help the golfers? It How? doesn't make any sense. Sally Jenkins, I'm running out of time. It's always a pleasure to read you uh, and to hear from you on this as well. So thank you. And thank, thank you all you. for being with us this hour. I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson, who we're all up in smoke right now, right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.